Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Skudik Institute out here on the Skudik Peninsula on another one of Maine's mysterious weather system days. Um, we have an exciting program this evening, but first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to come out tonight for this program. It's really special to us to see so many people from the local community and people from away. For instance, tonight, um, for the first time, um, we have with us a bird eco-tour program that is, has been launched by Mr. Bob Duchesne, who is the author of the Maine Birding Trail. He's right here. And myself, we put together this package and um, we have, by show of hands, um, a faithful group of 11 people from all over the country, in including one native Australian, <laughs> who have been touring. Um, we started out in Baxter State Park for a couple of days and birded in the park and as well as on the border of the park. And, um, and now the next two and a half days, well now one, one day remaining, we'll be here working out of Cirque, and today we were down east a bit into the Blueberry Barrens above Cherryfield and those places. We saw upland sandpipers and um, some other good things today, and we searched fruitlessly for spruce grouse in Baxter State Park as well as here along the coast. So if anybody ever sees one of those things, would you let me know, please? <laughs> I should introduce myself. My name is Seth Benz, and I'm the director of the bird ecology program here at Skudik Institute. And I would like to introduce uh, another very special guest. Um, by way of acknowledgement, the Institute has just uh, recently captured a new president and CEO, and, that is, and he is Mark Berry and his family, Asa and Julia. Welcome. I'd get the crowd to do their, their uh, most welcome, warmest bird chirping, but we'll do away with that. But welcome. It's great to have you guys here. So tonight's program um, is a really special one for me um, for a couple of different reasons. One, because of the speaker herself, and two, because of a, a little bit of my background. I actually did some seabird work for a couple of years, and so and Sue and I um, worked on a special island in Muscungus Bay called Hog Island, where the story of the puffin really came to the state of Maine. Sue has um, worked intimately with puffins and terns and restoration projects around the world on seabird islands. And she's uh, especially gifted at um, sound system techniques and something called the social attraction system. And I won't go into that. I'll let her talk about that if she will. And she's going to speak with us for maybe 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And tonight, when we first met, when she first got here, she received a text. Now, that's a text coming into the campus where cell phones rarely work. You have to get to specific spots just to show you how, sh how good she is. She found that spot. <laughs> received a text, and the text had the latest information on what's going on on the Puffin Islands along the coast of Maine. So we'll, you'll get, you'll be the first public people to get the latest update news from the Puffin Islands. Um, as I said, Sue's been all over the world. Her degree, she, she worked at, uh, or went to school at the University of New Hampshire, and um, has been with Project Puffin since 1984, yep, and she is um, a Disney World heroine. She was recognized by the Disney Corporation for her work with seabirds. So she's a very, very important person and a great personal friend. I'd like to introduce seabird Sue Schubel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It is a pleasure to come up and see this beautiful part of the world. This is really gorgeous up here. I'm from 
down in Muscongas Bay, which is another beautiful part of the world, and I was just thinking this spring how Maine has really got to be up there in the top beautiful places. Uh, so I work for the National Audubon Society for the Seabird Restoration Program, also known affectionately as Project Puffin. And you can find us all over the place whenever there's a picture of a puffin. We might have a little voice in that. Uh, you can look on the boxes of puffin cereal and see our founder, Steve Kress, on there. Somebody just said to me, that is the ornithological equivalent of being on a Wheaties box. <laughs> so Maine has a lot of islands, more than 4,000 islands along the coast of Maine. You would think, wow, what a great place for seabirds to nest. They tend to like to nest on offshore islands. Not all of these islands, though, are really suitable for seabirds. Back in the past, there were a lot more seabirds. In fact, uh, the naturalist on the ship Archangel in 1605 wrote that there were blizzards of birds on the main islands. And when you step onto a seabird island, it looks like a blizzard of birds because a lot of these birds rise up in the air and they swirl all around with their white and gray wings and it's like a blizzard. The first Europeans who settled in this country, they thought this is great. This is a ready source of food on these islands. They could go out onto an island. Many of these islands you'll notice are named Egg Rock because people would go there to harvest eggs. Certainly before Europeans, the Native Americans would go out and use those resources also. But uh, Europeans really seemed to go out and use them to a higher degree. Eggers would go out and they would collect the eggs out of the nest. This is a turn nest. Turns you can see from those spotted eggs, they nest right out in the open so their eggs are camouflaged. Very easy to collect those eggs. Gulls also nest out on the surface and they have large eggs, bigger than chicken egg. So a great source of food. The eggers could go out there to gather up the eggs and then sell, sell them down in Portland and Boston, sell them at market. But how do you know if an egg is fresh? You can't have a half grown chick in your egg that you're selling for someone to bake a cake with. What they would do is they'd go out to the island and smash all the eggs, and then the birds responded by trying to lay more eggs. So they could go back in a few days and collect all fresh eggs. This was very hard on the population. Also, big birds like gulls and smaller birds like puffins are good to eat. So they would kill birds for food. Puffins were particularly easy to get because they nest underground in these underground little, in some places, in underground sod burrows. And mostly in Maine, they find little crevices under the rocks and nest there. So you could put fishing nets over the rocks. And when the puffins came out in the morning, they would get caught in the nets. But the really most wasteful thing is that it became the fashion for women to wear feathers in their hats. So the millinery trade hard hit those birds. In the late 1800s, this was the style in Boston, in all the cities. And all kinds of birds, whole birds, wings of birds, any kind of bird were on these hats. Luckily, at some point, there were some women who said, this is ridiculous. We would like to see some birds out in nature, not just on people's heads. <laughs> but. By 1900, almost all the seabirds were gone on the coast of Maine. There were not even any seagulls left. Seagulls, speaking broadly. Any kind of gulls left. If you can imagine Maine with no seabirds, it was indeed shocking. The skies were empty. Luckily, those concerned citizens, uh, they got their influential men friends involved, and they started trying to protect these birds. One of the first things they did was the group of people who later became National Audubon Society, they started to hire the light keepers to protect the birds. So the, a lot of these really good seabird islands were the same islands that there were lighthouses on. And prior to them being protected, a lot of people would go hunt there. You could get uh, a, 
a pair of turn wings would bring in some good money, and many terns nested on these islands. So they hired the lightkeeper at Matinicus Rock in 1900 to be the first Audubon warden. And uh, actually, he died, but in his replacement in 1901 really became the first warden. And so the terns started to respond positively to that. They, as long as you're not killing them, they can re rebound and reproduce, and terns can migrate around and fill in new niches. Puffins, however, had a much harder time. The thing about puffins is that they don't normally go to new places. So even though on Matinicus Rock, we were down to one pair of puffins, and that was the only pair of puffins in Maine, that little population did start to grow as they were protected from hunting, but uh, they weren't going to recolonize any of the other islands that they used to be on. So along came Steve Kress, Dr. Stephen Kress. Actually, he, this was before he was doctor. He was Steve Kress, and he was teaching bird life at the Audubon camp in Maine, which is the island I just came from, Hog Island. This is the site of the first conservation camp in the country, the first National Audubon camp, and it was designed in 1936 to teach teachers how to conserve things, conserve nature. And so they, their idea was teach the teachers so that they could go spread the word to all their students. So Steve was teaching there in 1969. He started teaching there. And he thought, what a shame that there are not puffins down the bay on Eastern Egg Rock where there used to be puffins. Wouldn't it be great for the whole ecosystem and for these Audubon teachers to learn about the puffins of Eastern Egg Rock? This is Eastern Egg Rock, and you can see it is a really good seabird island. It's got a rubbly boulder berm around the outside. It's got low vegetation in the middle. It's far from land. It's at least four and a half miles from the mainland. So the mainland predators really can't get out there. And it was perfect, except that there were no puffins there. So he was a talented birder and loved birds, but he needed to know the specifics of bird biology in order to really help them. The fact that puffins don't really move to new islands on their own because they have very strong natal site fidelity. So they'll always return to the islands that they fledged from as little chicks. Puffins, are, they stay down in their burrow during their whole nestling period. A puffin incubates its egg. It's one egg per year for six weeks. Actually, both members of the pair take turns incubating. And then they keep, the chick stays down in the burrow where it's really safe, and both parents bring fish to the chick for another six weeks. They rear that chick up. You can see this one's getting some feathers on its chest, and it's still kind of fluffy all over the rest of it. But by the time it's six weeks old, it will have adult feathers, contour feathers all over. Its face will still be a little darker than an adult, and it'll still have a gray beak like that and little soft gray feet. But at that point, the puffin departs in the middle of the night all on its own, runs down to the sea as fast as it can, and swims away from the island, not to come back for several years. Its parents don't go with it. So he thought, OK, the puffins return to the island they fledged from. They don't need parental care after they leave. Perhaps we could be puffin parents. So adult puffins go to sea every winter and return back to their burrows. But the young puffins don't need to come back to land until they're old enough to lay their own egg, which is age four or five years old. So in 1973, he thought he would start this experiment of going to a place where there were many puffins, getting some puffin chicks, bringing them down to Eastern Egg Rock, raising them up, being puffin parents on the island, and then when they fledged, hopefully, they would imprint on that island and return there when they were of age. So Great Island, Newfoundland is a place with many puffins. You can see puffins all over. Now, they nest in a little bit different habitat there. The sod is very thick, and the burrows are about that big around, deep into the sod, longer than your arm sometimes. But that was a place where he got permission to go and catch some young chicks. They were brought down. Oh, let me 
show you that flat suitcase that the person is carrying. That's a special puffin carrying case that he invented. And inside, there, the original one had soup cans, 20 soup cans, so that each puffin chick could have its own little compartment, since they're always only children. Wanted to keep them separate. And it had burlap on the sides for ventilation. And they were very careful to to immediately get those puffins out of their burrows into the carrying case. They had a, a neighbor that actually volunteered to fly a plane from Canada down to Maine. And it took quite, you know, it's, it's pretty long ways, but it was a relatively quick trip flying down, going through customs, getting to, to Bremen, taking them out in the boat and tucking them into these little art, artificial burrows that they had made ahead of time out of sod. And you can see there, that's uh, burrow number 22. And it has a little screen, which was closed for the first few days until the puffin got used to its home. And then it was left open, and they never came out. They didn't want to run away. They were content down there getting fed every day. They were fed uh, mostly silver sides or other small frozen fish, which were supplemented with vitamins put into them. They were carefully tracked, weighed, and measured every few days just to make sure they were growing well. And this is a little fledgling, so that one's ready to go. It, this one was particularly friendly, so it came out for a photo. But generally, it wouldn't come out of its burrow until it was ready to leave one night. And we would come back the next day to check the burrow, and the bird would be gone out to sea. Now, these are adults out at sea, but those little puffin chicks, imagine going out to sea. You've never touched the water before. You've never had to find your own food. There are a lot of dangers out there. This is the most dangerous time in their life when they first leave the burrow. They have to watch out for oil spills and getting tangled up in plastic. They have to be able to find food. It's, it's a really dangerous time of life. So the first year or two when they're learning the ropes is the time when we lose most of the ones that we're going to lose. So Eastern Egg Rock, perfect little island that it is, wasn't quite ready to receive the puffins yet. During the time when there were no puffins nesting there and no terns nesting there, a lot of large gulls had moved in because they are early to the islands, earlier arriving from their winter migration back to the islands, and they're strong and aggressive and smart herring gulls and great black back gulls. So he, uh, he cleared the islands of gull nests to make it more welcoming for the other birds and put decoys out. Since puffins are colonial seabirds, they are used to living with hundreds or thousands of other puffins. That was a key thing. So this was a whole part of the, the thing that became known as the social attraction technique. You had to provide a faux colony until there could be a real colony. So when the puffins came back, they needed to see other birds to show them that this was a safe island and there was food nearby and they could potentially find a mate. Now the terns often nest with puffins and he thought we really need to get the terns to come nest here too because they provide a protective umbrella over the colony. When a puffin's threatened, its response is to run away even if you stick your hand in its burrow, it really wants to run away. It has to run away to live another day. But terns, since they nest out on the ground, they're much more aggressive. And as a colony, they could drive away intruders. So they can drive away a, a gull or a great blue heron, a lot of things. They'll gang up and get it out of there. Uh, so his idea was, let's get a tern colony to be established on this island too. Now, they have a very different life history. So terns nest out in the open. Both parents incubate the eggs. Both parents take turns feeding the chicks. But when it's time to migrate, the whole family goes, actually the whole flock kind of leaves together and goes. This is a fledgling common tern begging from its parents. So you can't be a tern parent and then let them go. You'd have to migrate to South America with them. So part of the strategy that we really used for attracting terns was the sound element. This is a sound system that I made. It's got a wooden box, a weatherproof box, 
that holds an MP3 player and an amplifier and a battery that gets recharged by the solar panel. And it plays 24 hours a day. So this one is not on Eastern Egg Rock. This is in uh, South Carolina, I think. But the, stre the, the technique is that you make it sound like a big turn party all the time. So when those turns come by, and their flocks are a lot more fluid, they will move to different islands. When they come by, they see some turn decoys, they hear the turn sounds, the top 10 turn hits, they are gonna move right in. And in fact, it worked remarkably well. And soon they were breeding on the island. Within two years, they were breeding on the island. Oh, so cute. <laughs> It took the puffins a little bit longer. So 1973, he brought the first puffins down. 1979, the first puffins were seen amongst the decoys again. So that took a while. It took a lot of patience and hope and believing in it. But a lot of birds die when they're young, and it takes a long time for them to mature. In 1981, this is what was seen, a puffin carrying fish, and that is what they were really looking for. A puffin does not carry fish unless it's going to take it to its chicks in the burrow. So successful breeding in 1981. And you can see in 1981, we have four pairs of puffins breeding. It was a very exciting time. And then the number jumped up a little bit, and we had about... 16 to 18 for quite some time. And people thought, is this all that the island can handle? Maybe this is the carrying capacity because it's at the very southern part of the puffins range. Puffins are across the whole North Atlantic, but they don't really go further south than Eastern Egg Rock. Then we had this steep increase in numbers. And a couple of years ago, we had our top number so far of 123 pairs of puffins from zero. That was pretty good. In 2012, you can see it dropped down a bit. We had some predator issues that year. And then last year, it dropped down a bit more. But all the seabirds were having a really hard time last year. The ocean was not providing them with food. Actually, the summer before, you know, in 2013, the adults were weak from having wintered poorly. So they, were, they came in kind of weak. Some of them chose not to breed because it takes a lot of effort to do that. And partway through the season, it seemed that the fish supply dropped off so that they weren't able to raise those chicks all the way. Now, on Matinicus Rock, one of the other islands we work on, <clears throat> we're able to really track a lot of the chicks. So we can see how the chick survival is for each year class. On Eastern Egg Rock, it's very hard to get into the burrows to ban the individual chicks. But on Matinicus, we can get in and do at least half of them. So you can see that it varies, the survival varies a lot from year to year. Incredibly, that one year, 1993, was our highest percent of survival. 95% of those chicks survived and returned to the islands. That was amazing to me. So you can see on, on the graph that the 90s were really good years. Those birds must have been in a clean, healthy ocean. They were finding plenty of fish. And lately, it hasn't been quite as good. It's been kind of erratic, but last, uh, in 2011, was not too good, 2010. And it's, it's been not too good for a few years. Since the puffins live a long time, the oldest known puffin is 36 years old. We have a number who are in their 30s. This, you would expect quite a bit of variation. They just have one chick a year. They don't start breeding until they're quite old, four or five years old. And so a puffin could potentially have 30 chicks in its lifetime. You wouldn't expect them all to live. But we, we are concerned a bit about the current state of the ocean. Hopefully it's just a blip and we'll come back. So since we had such great success restoring these seabirds, now what? Well, now we study them every year because they are telling us a lot about what's going on in the ocean. They are our canaries. That's a razor bill, by the way, another member of the puffins family, in the Alcid family. So every year we work on seven different islands and we count thoroughly all the nests on each island. In fact, everybody who works on seabird islands in the whole Gulf of Maine we all work together so that 
I think it's next week is the count period. Everybody will go out on their islands and count every single egg in every single nest on the island. All the ones that nest on the surface, at least. So that upper left nest, that's a common turn nest. That's a laughing gull nest. This is an odd turn nest down here. And a common eider, that sea duck that you see around here, that's its nest. <clears throat> so how, how do you do that? How do you count a thousand nests? How do you count a thousand pairs of birds? What you do is you get four or five biologists in a line, arm's length apart, and you walk slowly back and forth over the island, searching every single part of it, through every raspberry bush, over every rock. And each person who sees a nest yells out the number of eggs in that nest. The person walking behind is taking the notes, and so you're, here, you're yelling out, two, three, two, one, two. Everybody in the line is yelling these things out. The person behind is yelling back so that they know that they've been heard and writing it down. Meanwhile, all the turns are screaming, and they're diving, and they're pooping, and they're pecking you in the head. It's a good time. <laughs> so once we know how many nests we have to start with, we really want to know how many chicks are produced. And generally, you gauge the productivity based on the number of chicks per nest. We can do that by keeping a certain sample of nests that we really intensively study. And we make a little fenced area so that the chicks can't run too far away, because once they hatch, they really can run around quite a bit, although they stay tied to their nest area for when the parents come with food, they'll, they'll locate them there. So we, in, in an enclosure, we keep track of all these turns that we put bands on so we can check each individual and we can measure them. And you can see that these turns have bands on their legs. They have a eight digit number on that little band. It's hard to read unless you have the chick in your hand. It's hard to read on adults, but we do also study which adults are nesting where by reading that band number through a telescope or capturing them again. So here's a puffin band. You can see the numbers on that puffin band. <coughs> what is that thing on the other leg? Well, lately we've been doing a lot of exciting work learning about where these birds go when they're not in Maine. It was always a gigantic mystery. Where do the puffins go? Out to sea was all we knew. This little thing called a geolocator can record the sunrise and sunset time every day. And the only trick about it is it's not like a satellite tag that's sending information up and down to our computers every minute. It's a thing that's on the bird collecting information. We have to catch the bird and get that off and hope that it stayed waterproof for a year and hope that the battery's okay and then you can put, put it, attach it to your computer and make a map. So we made a map. We had one bird that didn't get caught the first year, but it was caught the second year. So we got two years worth of information on this little bird who they named Cabot because he was an explorer. And you can see some of these marks don't seem quite right. You have to kind of filter out the things that don't seem quite right because the puffins aren't into the mountains of Maine. But generally, it seems that this bird, two years in a row, went up past Labrador. Well, actually, the first year it just went up near Newfoundland, down to the ocean near Bermuda, and back to Maine. Then the second year went further up in past Labrador, up into the Gulf of Labrador up there, and then down again near Bermuda and back to Maine. Never landing on land, but spending all that time in the ocean. It's a long ways. We really were thinking that they just went out into the North Atlantic, although sometimes puffins have been seen down off North Carolina on pelagic boat trips. So that was quite amazing. Now this is a map from Arctic terns which had geolocators put on their legs. This is totally amazing. The Arctic tern is the master migrant of the bird world. It flies farther than any other bird. It sees more sunlight than any other animal. And you can see that these guys who started up in Maine, they, what was really interesting is we, it, 
they had pieced together the migration from just regular band recoveries along its route. They knew that it went over towards Africa, down the coast of Africa, down to Antarctica, and then came back a long ways. But what they found out, some other interesting things they found were that first it went out into the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean and hung out for about a month, probably just regaining strength. Maybe that was a place with really good fishing. And then some groups, well, most of them went over towards Europe, down the coast of Africa. In that middle area, some of them split off and went down the coast of South America. Some went down the coast of Africa. They all met up down in Antarctica. They're flying around back and forth around Antarctica for months and then zoomed back up to Maine in time for the breeding season. <clears throat> Another thing we really like to study every year is the diet of the birds. So terns, since they nest out in the open, are particularly easy to study. They bring in fresh sushi every day to their chicks. Nice whole fish. They don't regurgitate it, so it's easy to Look at that fish and identify it. You can see that one has a forked tail and it's nice and shiny. That's a herring. We would write down <clears throat> the number of fish that are brought in each day, the length of it compared to the bird's beak, and then which chick in the nest gets the food. Here's one bringing in a little tiny euphousid shrimp. So we want to keep track of what they bring in, and then we can measure the turn chicks to see which diet helps them grow the best. Last year was our 40th anniversary for the project, and it's amazing how much information we've gathered and how many interesting things we've done. We now work on seven different islands along the coast, from Scarborough, uh, from um, Stratton Island down off Prout's Neck up to Seal Island off Vinyl Haven. This is Jenny Island, a little tiny island in Casco Bay. All these islands provide another basket for our eggs. We don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. We want to spread out the population along the coast. So if something bad happens in one location, it doesn't affect everybody. Not all of these islands are puffin islands, but we're also committed to the other seabirds of Maine, particularly the terns. On Stratton Island, they've also been studying the migrating songbirds. Turns out these islands are really important stopovers on the migration route up and down. And Matinicus Rock, where that first Audubon lightkeeper was, is an important station where I've spent quite a lot of time. <clears throat> Since these birds are citizens of the world, it's particularly important that we engage people from other places so we have a fellowship that brings in our international fellows to work with us here in Maine. And then we also are working on projects with them in their home countries. This is a little Cassin's Auklet in Mexico. There are many seabird restoration projects that are using the social attraction techniques now that started right in Maine and all over the world. A couple of really exciting ones lately are in China, the Chinese crested tern is really, really rare. Less than 50 pairs exist in the world. And they put out some sound systems last year to attract those birds in, and they're already breeding at that location. So one thing is to bring the birds to a place that's safer or to a place where they can be protected. But you can see many, many good projects going on. We want to educate the youth. So we have a seabird education program. And I go into a lot of schools along with my colleague, Puff and Pete. And we teach those kids about the wonder of seabirds. A lot of them live in fishing communities. So they know about seabirds from being out on their parents' boats. But they don't know everything about those seabirds. So they learn a little bit more. And they can provide information to their whole family. We have a live puffin cam that you can watch on our website, projectpuffin.org. It's in a puffin burrow. We have a burrow cam, and we have one out on the rocks, which is really cool. And you can see that right now it's an egg, but you can see that egg hatch out and watch that chick as it develops. It's so important that we engage the whole world. Think about our globe-trotting birds. 
they are traveling all over the place. It's not just up to us. Even though we take really good care of them here, when they go off far away, lots of things can happen to them. So if you're interested in learning more about birds, I'll just put in a plug for Hog Island. We're still offering residential camp programs there with top birders from all over the country. Beautiful, another beautiful part of Maine. And you can learn about puffins and go visit them at Eastern Egg Rock. These birds are counting on us. Everything we do has an impact. So let's make it a positive one. And now I'm going to just put in a little plug for uh, the underappreciated member of the Allison family. You know, people love puffins. They think razor bills are really sexy. But the little black guillemots, which is pretty common in Maine, you can see them all around. They're really neat, cute. They've got adorable red feet. When they open their mouths, they have a beautiful red mouth lining. They're really kind of overlooked. So about 23 years ago, we started Guillemot Appreciation Day which has now become an international holiday, and I imagine Seth will be celebrating it here. <laughs> um, it's June 27th every year, so get out your red shoes or socks and think about composing a ballad to the beautiful black kilomots. <laughs> now, that's, that's all for my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions, but first I'm going to start passing something around so you have a chance to experience it while we do question. <clears throat> I can pass around one of our original decoys. This has been actually kissed by a puffin. <laughs> it's made of wood. It's a little bit heavy. And then this is always just a very fun thing. You know, these birds are so well adapted to live out in the cold, wet, salty ocean. And they, they can live out there because of their nice layer of fat that they acquire when they're getting enough food, and also because of their super warm, downy feathers. Now, this is not puffin down. This is from an eider duck's nest. But it's amazing to experience bird technology in the hand. It's so light. You can't even believe it. How could birds invent something that was so light and so warm? So the way to pass this around is that the person getting it should hold their hands out nice and flat and close their eyes, and the person passing it should sneak it onto their hand and see if they notice. Close your eyes. Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So I wanted to play a puffin sound for you because that it's a really surprising voice. Now, puffins don't really say a lot. They talk when they're down in their burrows. They talk to their mates and their chicks. But mostly, they are pretty quiet when they're out on the rocks with hundreds or thousands of birds. But this is their voice. It's a funny sound for a little bird. Since they, since they don't really talk a lot, we didn't use sound too much for attracting puffins. Mostly we just had the decoys out. They're very visual birds, and they like a crowd. But with the turns, they are a lot more vocal. So we had those turn sounds going 24 hours a day in addition to the decoys. And when we mean decoys, we tried out a variety of different kinds of decoys. Some looked very realistic. Some were basically a piece of gray two by four with a dowel for a head. And you'd think, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> but those birds, they came in. They offered them courtship fish. They were desperate. <laughs> this is the sound of Arctic terns.
Oh, so the, the information that I got right before this on my text <laughs> was that, well, we don't know the numbers yet for this year because next week is the nest counting week. But it seems that Arctic turn numbers are down. They seem to be significantly down, which when you look at that migration, there could be problems anywhere along that long route. So we're worried about that. It does seem like there are more puffins at the first check of their nest, there do seem to be a lot of puffins on eggs, so that's good. So maybe it means that the adults had a better winter this past winter and they were feeling fit enough to produce an egg. And um, I can't really tell you much more than that. So we're still really early in the season. Nobody's really hatched yet, so we're not, although we've seen quite a few courtship fish in the turns beaks, which look like pretty good hake and herring, about a couple of inches long, that's ideal. Uh, so we're hopeful, but it's a little early to tell. Last year, things seemed pretty good till midway in the season, and then, then they ran out of good fish, and they were trying to feed very wide butterfish that the chicks couldn't swallow. So uh, we're hopeful, but it's too early to tell. But I'm happy to answer any questions now anybody has. Can you hold on a second, because we'd like you to speak. Please, what was the address of the Puffin Cam? So if you go to projectpuffin.org, you can see our Puffin Cam. It, we have a partnership with explore.org, and there are a lot of cool cams on there. Also at the Audubon Camp on Hog Island, we have an Osprey Cam, and those chicks just hatched last week, so we have three little chicks in that nest that we're watching. And, oh, this is exciting. We are going to have a guillemot cam. <laughs> Should be online pretty soon, within a few days, I hope. Uh, how large is Eastern Egg Rock? Eastern Egg Rock is only seven acres in size. So the birds are really packed on there. A thousand pairs of terns, a thousand pairs of laughing gulls, a hundred plus pairs of puffins, storm petrels nesting under the sod, eider ducks under the shrubs. It's just a layer cake of birds. Five biologists. <laughs> From your provisioning studies, what seems to be the most um, nutritious fish for the terns and the, and the puffins? It seems like herring is the best. It has really good oils, and so it has a lot of calories per unit. And in the southern islands that we work on, Jenny Island especially, they often have really great herring near that island. And so even though it's prone to predator issues, being very close to shore, if the predators are under control, they can get a lot of chicks, common turn chicks, produced at that place. So more than two chicks per nest sometimes, which is really great. Is the sand lance still important to the stratton? Um... Yep, sand lance is also a good fish, it, and abundant and easy to swallow. And, but sand lance likes to live in a sandy habitat, so Stratton Island is perfect for that, being right off Old Orchard Beach, but some of our northern islands don't have sand lance because they don't have sand. <laughs> Yes, you say the turns almost disappeared. Was that the origin of the saying, one good turn deserves another? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Is there some biological significance to the colors of the puffin's beak? Well, you'll notice that a lot of seabirds and other marine animals have the black on, dark on top, white underneath coloration. So sharks and tuna and whales and birds. And that's thought to be good camouflage. So if you're looking from above, that black back blends nicely into the deep dark sea. And if you're looking from below, like you're a shark looking up at the light sky, the white would blend in. And then the kids say, well, what about those orange beaks? Well, it seems like that is for sexual selection. So usually birds have bright colored parts so that they can show that they are fit, that they would be a good mate, they can find food, and they're healthy. And so it does seem like big puffin beaks show that you've survived a long time because their beaks get bigger as they age, and 
if they're colorful, they're getting a good diet. And so some people also have suggested maybe they could use it as a fishing lure when they're going through a, a flock of, a school of fish. When you do the nesting count, you said that you would even walk through the brambles. I spent a week on Jenny Island and it's all poison ivy. Oh yeah, that's hard. What do you do about it? <laughs> Long pants. <laughs> yeah, Jenny Island also has stinging nettles and cow parsnips, which give you contact dermatitis when uh, they're photos, photoreactive contact dermatitis. So you have to be really devoted to be a seabird biologist. <laughs> Questions? I have read about the um, disappearance of, of the proper fish for the baby puffins. Does that, is that just a natural up and down cycle or is it global warming? Well, that's what we don't know for sure, but it does seem like fish respond to changing water temperatures and some of them can't, there's not as much oxygen in warmer water. The herring and schooling fish prefer colder water, so they might be moving. And it does seem like in Iceland that's the case, that the fish are moving away. Uh, you know, most of the puffins in the world are in Iceland, and they have been doing terribly for years now. So it could be a combination of overfishing. It could be climate change with the water temperature and the currents changing, because these guys migrate on the currents. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to really prove that, but you can correlate things, and it seems like that's all a risk. So, you know, hopefully, uh, maybe, maybe things will change a bit. Right now, down off Baja, Mexico, where some of our partners are working, they're having an El Nino year, but it's not an El Nino year every year. So there they have some bad years, and then they recover with some good years. Are there, <clears throat> are there still humans uh, egging? Not in this country. It's illegal to have any egg of a migratory non-game bird or any feather of a migratory non-game bird. So we protect our birds pretty well here, but they're going around the world without passports, <laughs> and they go to all different countries where there are all different sorts of conservation laws and human conditions, places where people are worried about being at war or starving, and they might have less sympathy for a bird, a little bird who has needs. On these islands with all the different <clears throat> species, is there any competition? Do they um, attack each other's nests or? or well, we, we try so to um, play a positive role in some of that. So. If there are any large gulls nesting, which pretty much there aren't anymore, they, we've, uh, we've supplanted them. <clears throat> but early in the season, occasionally a herring gull or a blackback will try to nest, and then we, try to br we break up its nest. And if there are any predatory birds who are staying around and eating a lot of chicks, we do try to kill them. We take them out of the population. Um, <clears throat> There's some competition between the laughing gulls and the terns. They, they will sometimes eat tern chicks, but more often they steal the food from the terns. So the terns are trying to bring the food into the chicks and the laughing gulls will pirate that away. Um, but the puffins and terns get along without problem. In fact, I think that they, they do help each other with the terns being aggressive and driving away intruders. <clears throat> and also they may help them you know, more birds out flying around looking for fish can advertise to each other about where the school of fish, the moving school of fish is. And those terns are high up in the sky, nice and white, easy to see. So I'm sure that they pinpoint schools and then all the birds can go out and have a feeding frenzy there. So most of the birds get along pretty well, but then there are some conflicts. And a lot of it's just how the populations weigh out, you know, when there are just a few of laughing gulls, it's not so bad as when there are a lot of laughing gulls. Do we ever see a time when, um, y you've talked a lot about the human partnership with the seabirds. It seems that that partnership is really important to the survival of seabirds. Do we see that going away anytime soon, or is that something that seabird biologists will have to do in perpetuity? I think we'll be involved in it. 
forever because we're involved in everything. We're part of nature, we gotta play a role. Everything we do, you know, we're using electricity here, that means that we have to be carrying oil across the oceans. That's putting birds at risk. So I think that we really have to play a positive role in keeping the birds safe and doing what we can just to uh, keep things in balance. We take up a lot of space, we people, and we use a lot of resources. We have a big impact. And so I don't see any problem with employing biologists far into the future. <laughs> when you think about it, it's amazing. With all those 4,000 islands off the coast of Maine, there are only four main islands with puffins on them. And five if you count the neighboring Canadian one right over the border in the Gulf of Maine. And there are about 25 to 30 with tern colonies on them. And there are about 250 with large gull colonies on them. That leaves a lot of islands for other things. Well, the puffins, uh, I think they, you know, anything? What? The, the question was, does, do we know how well the, how, how well the seabird colony at Petit, Petit Manan is doing? So it just so happens we have someone in our audience who is intimately familiar with what's happening at Petit Manan, I believe, or at least you're going to be, right? Be. Well, the only thing I've heard so far this year is that there seems to be less turns than there have been in the past. Yeah, and I think we're seeing all over the place that there are fewer Arctic turns particularly. Common turns may be similar. I don't know about at Petit Manan, but... Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages that island, and we always connect with them, but I haven't heard lately what's going on. I think, uh, actually, I ran into Brian Benedict, and he told me that turn numbers seem to be down. So the turn, something is going on with those turns, especially the Arctic turn. Last question, and then... I think it's too early to tell. They're, as Sue has indicated, they're, they're going to be doing the surveys in a week or so, and um, then we'll know more about that. Well, they have a small population of puffins out there, I think around 60 to 80 pairs usually. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see. We always come together at the end of the season in August. You know, it's a pretty short season, really, and the puffins are not probably even hatched yet. I don't think any of our puffins have hatched yet. Um, so once they hatch, then we'll have a better handle because a lot of puffin nests you can't see into and you just have to watch for adults bringing fish in. And we have our burrows all numbered. So once they start feeding, you can keep track of nest number one has had a feeding on June 14th. And then you track it and you assume that if they feed there for 15 days, we're going to count that as a puffin who fledged, even though if they really need 40 days to fledge in case we missed some. That's just we, what we use for a gauge. So they'll be doing that at Petit Manan, and we'll, we'll find out what's going on. You know, I think they have a really good website through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they sometimes blog about Petit Manan also on there. So you could look on that website and find out. Well, thank you very much, Sue, for a very, very informative program. Thank you. Welcome. If anyone has any uh, further questions, um, Sue will hang around for a little bit and you can ask her personally. And I want to alert you to uh, the next um, public program sponsored by the Scudic Institute Bird Ecology Program. It'll be on Tuesday night, July the 8th, when we're bringing um, one of Isra or Israel's foremost ornithologists, Dr. Yossi Leshem who has spent a lot of time in the air with migratory birds going from Europe to Africa. And um, he will be here as our guest speaker. Um, the time is yet to be determined. We, we still haven't figured that out. But I assure you it'll be somewhere in the vicinity of 5.30 to 7. Most programs have been at 7 o'clock, and I think that's what we're going to go with. But um, watch our website if you want, or the paper. We'll have that announcement shortly. And thanks again very much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. Thanks. <laughs>